Hi, in this video, we're going to be talking about A-B testing. Um, now, a lot of what we've done as data scientists is take some sort of data set, do some analysis, and get some answers. And, uh, and that's a big part of what data scientists do, and many of you may end up in jobs uh, doing that sort of thing. Um, but another piece to it is that maybe somebody has like a, a, some sort of like website or business, <coughs> and, um, and they don't want you to just analyze the data, but they also want you to be actively involved in running these little miniature experiments and collecting data and, uh, and then kind of feeding that back and deciding what to do uh, in terms of business decisions or kind of new designs. And, and so a lot of the things I'm going to talk today are actually from this keynote talk by uh, Ronnie Kohavi um, that he gave at the Knowledge Discovering and Data Mining um, conference some years back in 2015. And, uh, and Ronnie, he works at uh, Microsoft on Bing. Bing is Microsoft search engine. And for a long time at Microsoft, there would be these kind of awards when you shipped your code. By shipping your code, it means that you kind of send it out to where a customer could see it. And eventually they realize this is not great. Uh, just shipping code is not necessarily success. We actually want to measure, did we do what we were hoping to do? Uh, do we have a better product? And so this tweet here is what he's celebrating is that shipping awards are done and they're using this A-B testing to gather evidence or um, you know, whether or not they made a real improvement. So I wanna think a little bit about experimental design in general before we talk about how we might uh, kind of optimize something like Bing. And, and by the way, uh, maybe going back a bit, a, a lot of the examples I have here are kind of drawn from that talk that, uh, that he had given. And you're welcome to go and watch the whole thing if you want. I think it's relatively uh, accessible. Okay, so, so background on experimental design. Um, let's say you have a bunch of programmers and you're trying to figure out whether coffee improves their programming ability. So experimental design uh, is kind of describing, well, what process will we use to try to answer this question? And, and so let me give you an example of a design, not necessarily a good one, but we could try to do some sort of before and after uh, thing. We could take all of our people and, um, and give them no coffee and ask them to do a programming project and measure on average how long it takes. So let's say it takes them um, 16 hours. Well, then we could erase all their code, uh, give them coffee and ask them to do it again. And well, maybe it's faster or maybe it's eight hours. But do you have any concerns about this? I, I think one of the big concerns here is, well, maybe it wasn't about the coffee. Maybe they just got better uh, and more experienced from kind of the first time until the second time. And so a common way people will do this in their experiments is they'll take their population of programmers and up front they'll divide them into two groups. They might call those groups the control group and the treatment group. And it's very important that you randomly assign people. Um, otherwise, maybe somehow you're assigning all the good programmers to the same group. So if you do this and you give the people in the treatment group coffee and don't give people in the control group anything, uh, well, then you can measure and see uh, what kind of difference you have. Maybe for the control group, it's 16.3 hours. And then for the treatment group, maybe it's 15.4 hours. A big question there is whether that difference is just about noise or it's actually a, a kind of a meaningful, significant signal. signal. And, um, and statistics can answer that question. I'm not ready to go deep into statistics in this course. Uh, but that could answer that. Well, how much of a difference uh, uh, is, is, you know, in all likelihood noise versus it's actually evidence that, that something is uh, a meaningful difference. Now, there's other things you could imagine improving here too. Like, you know, maybe I could give decaf coffee to people in the control group or uh, do other things to kind of make sure that they don't have this placebo effect where maybe uh, having a cup of coffee in your hand kind of artificially just boosts your uh, confidence. Um, but, but this is kind of a, a okay design, right? Where we have this control and treatment group. If I wanted to generalize a little bit beyond just control and treatment, uh, I wouldn't necessarily uh, have to have this control. Maybe I just want to compare uh, two different things. I want to say, well, is coffee better uh, or is tea better, right? Uh, that would be A-B testing uh, in general, right? So I'd say this control and treat treatment um, is kind of a more specific version of, of A-B testing. And, and so this kind of makes sense for these uh, kind of human experiments. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today, though, is, well, what does it look like to do A-B testing uh, maybe at a big company if you're trying to optimize, uh, optimize the software or the product? <clears throat> so here is a picture of what that looks like. Um, what we'll do is we will um, uh, split traffic in some way, right? So you have these either users or requests. 
And we're going to send them to different versions. Maybe version A, maybe that's a control or a previous version. And a version B, where we vary some factors about the site. Maybe we have like a bigger font size or a red font or something like that. Um, and so kind of splitting the users across these, we'll gather some metrics about both parties. Um, for example, a common metric that I'll be talking more about is click-through rate. If I show you an ad, what percentage of the time do you actually uh, click on it? Uh, maybe when that font, when that uh, ad has like big red font, maybe people click more. Maybe it's off-putting and they click less. But we're gonna get these metrics and compare them in some way. And uh, we have to choose how we want to compare them and kind of what matters to us. Maybe we decide that <coughs> we want to maximize the click-through rate. And so then based on that, we have some sort of outcome. And uh, a common outcome is that, well, we make some sort of action. We might uh, try to switch to whatever is best. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about all the different parts of this uh, pipeline uh, in reverse order, right? I think it makes sense to start in reverse order because then it'll be fresh in our mind what we're hoping to achieve through all of this. And, and so I gave one example, well, we could take some sort of action uh, in the world, right? But other things we could do are we could learn something. And, and so I actually have a link here uh, to something I'll have in the reading, uh, which is kind of this, this notorious study that Facebook had done. Uh, what they did is they showed people in their news feeds either more positive or more negative content and then they wanted to see whether that could control uh, how positive or negative people were when they made their own posts. And no surprise, right? If you're exposed to positivity, you become more positive. And if you're exposed to negativity, uh, you become uh, more negative. And so from a learning perspective, this is uh, kind of cool, right? I mean, we, we learn how people behave, but there's also huge ethical concerns here. And so that's one of the things I want you to think about through all of this, right? Are, are these measurements we're doing or kind of the way we're dividing people or what is the treatment? Um, are we doing it in an ethical way? Um, you know, if this had been a university doing this kind of experiment, they would have had to submit their proposal to the IRB, that Institutional Review Board. Uh, Facebook didn't have to do that in this case. Um, the other thing that you could do, uh, which is really not, <laughs> it's hard to imagine an eth ethical concern here, uh, but say you want to upgrade um, from Python 3.7 to Python uh, 3.8. Um, now, ideally, that should have like no difference on anything, uh, but it's also possible that there's some bugs in your code that only really surface when you switch to Python 3.8. And, uh, and ideally, we would have written some sort of test that exposed that, but you know it's hard to test everything. So what people often do in this case is that uh, they'll be running both at the same time. Some of the code is running on 3.7, some is running on 3.8, and then they'll compare. Uh, maybe when we switch to 3.8, some things break for, let's say, all the Internet Explorer users. And so if we do these comparisons, we can see, well, we actually are hurting the business in some way and say, hey, I don't want to do that yet. But of course, our assumption or kind of our expectation is that these would work out just the same. So let's talk about these comparisons. Uh, when I get the metrics from version A and B, how can I figure out if it's kind of different or not? And, uh, and so here, I'm gonna give uh, one example of a metric where we'll be learning about others later. But I'm gonna look at the click-through rate. And the click-through rate is, is pretty simple. It's, well, how many times did I show you something? And then how many times did you click on the thing I showed you, right? So it'll be some sort of percentage. And, uh, and so what I could do is I could put that all in a data frame like this. I could say for version A, how many clicked and how many didn't click? And then for version B, how many clicked and how many didn't click. And this is called a contingency table. Um, the breakdown here is contingent on what version um, I'm showing people. And so if I want to look at this, well, how many impressions uh, of B did I have? I guess I showed B 20 times and they clicked six times. I guess that is a rate of 30%. And, uh, and I could actually just put this into pandas like this. I could say divide the clicks by uh, the sum of each row, and then I would get, well, version A is 15% and version B is 30%. And, and so our big question there is, um, is that just noise or is there probably actually some meaningful difference? And so we have to do some sort of statistical test. And I'm not trying to get into the statistics, but I'm going to get into how we can write code uh, to do that test. And, and so probably the easiest way is to use the stats module inside of SciPy. So SciPy is this package you could install like this, pip3 install uh, SciPy. And if you want to, you could take a data frame like this 
and feed it directly in to stats.fisherexactstats. And, and yes, this is the Fisher uh, who's so famous from statistics. And so what this is going to do is it's going to uh, look at this table and it's going to return back a couple things. Uh, the only thing we really care about is the second value. You can see I'm ignoring the first one. And that second value is, is a p-value. And here I can see that my p-value is 0 0.188. And really, the, the stronger the evidence I have that A and B are different, the smaller this p-value um, is going to be. Okay? And so what is that? Uh, one way I could think about it is that the p-value is the probability that I would see a difference between these so extreme in the case that, well, there's the underlying process is the same, right? So, so let me try to rephrase that. Um, let's say that, for the sake of argument, that A and B are the same, and uh, but if I collect enough samples, right, eventually I might get some sort of result where the difference is this extreme. Uh, this p-value is telling me that, that I would only expect that to happen about 19% um, of the time. And so in statistics, we have this idea of significance, and significance is really just in terms of the p-value. Um, we'll set some sort of threshold like 5% and say, well, if this is less than uh, 5%, we consider it a significant result. And, uh, and well, this would not be significant, right? Because it's like 19% instead of 5%. But um, you know, even though this was a, like kind of double the click-through rate, you know, I don't have enough evidence because my sample were too small. If I want to get a better, um, I want to get a better uh, p-value, right? Kind of a stronger, smaller p-value, then I could have this kind of breakdown, but with more data. Or it's also possible that the data could be more extreme and that might show up. Now, we also have this notion of a false positive rate. And by the false positive rate is, is well, um, let's say there is no difference between A and B. Um, either in terms of how people interact with it, or it could even mean that literally, uh, you know, what we're showing people for version A and B is identical. Um, false positive is, well, in this case where they're the same, um, how often do we have a significant result? You know, how often is a p-value less than uh, 5%? And, and so it turns out, just given the definition of this, the probability of seeing a difference um, if they're generated by the same underlying process that's the definition for the p-value, and I have 5% here for my threshold. The false positive rate in this case um, has to be 5% by, by definition, okay? Um, and so what does that mean? If I had 200 neutral changes, right, where B isn't really improving or, or kind of not improving, then if I set my threshold to 5%, uh, what will the false positives, how many false positives will I get? Well, 5% of 200 is 10, so I'll see 10 false positives. And so what they'll sometimes do in an organization like ben, Bing is they'll intentionally run not an A-B test, but an AA test to make sure the system is working. When they run the AA test, uh, is it finding uh, a significant result 5% of the time, which is what we would expect? If not, then maybe your platform itself is broken. So when you do this, there's really three possible outcomes that we could end up with, say, based on these click-through rates and significance. Um, one is that maybe A ends up being significantly better, or B might be significantly better, or a really common case is that neither one wins. And so I want you to think about what you would do if you're running some sort of website and you end up in this neither win situation. What would be the appropriate thing to do? And there's lots of um, different answers here. One, I mean, if we're really interested in learning, we might try to collect more data. Uh, you know, I don't have a lot of data here, and so that would be a fine option. Now, of course, that's not free, right? I want to run other experiments on my users. Um, there's a cost to uh, doing an experiment in terms of, well, it might be uh, kind of breaking things. There's some complexity to it. Uh, but if I really want to know the answer, well, I'd probably collect more data. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I have to make a decision, right? If I'm on my website and I show people either version A or B, well, I can't wait until I have statistical evidence. I have to do something at any given point in time. Right? When a user comes to my website, I should show them something. So it would be fine to actually just, in this case, make a business decision. Ignore the statistical significance and just look at the click-through rate and just go with whatever is higher, even if it's not a statistically significant result. 
Um, there's other things that you could do. Um, one is that you could default to whatever version you were running before, right? It's pretty often that this is one we've had for a while and B is something new we're um, considering as an alternative. That's not always the case. I mean, sometimes both of these are brand new, uh, but usually, you know, one is has some more uh, background. And so it'd be pretty reasonable to stick with that. I mean, it's familiar. There are probably fewer bugs involved. Um, in other cases, like let's say when I was talking about um, the Python version, well, we want to upgrade from Python 3.7 to 3.8, and we actually kind of expect that that won't affect anything. We expect that neither wins. So choosing a new version for B uh, makes a lot of sense in that situation. So, so Bing actually did this study where they uh, showed these two versions of the search page. And in general, when they're showing a search page, they want click-through rate. They want uh, some sort of indication that they're showing meaningful results. And, uh, and so I'm just curious, what do you think? Which version uh, of this website do you think people click on more? And it turns out that they click on this version more on the left, right? If there's underlines uh, for the hyperlinks, well, people like to click on that. And um, if you go to Bing now, you won't see this version, which is better in terms of the metric. You're going to see this version. And apparently this is a big controversy in, in, in the company, right? Even though the data said that people click on this more, uh, I think a lot of the designers and, and maybe even just kind of, you know, probably you and I think this one looks nicer. And so there's this big conflict. Well, do we maximize click-through rate or do we just do what looks nice? And uh, at the end of the day, they decided to do what looks nice. And that's what I encourage you to do too. Uh, metrics should inform humans, but not directly determine uh, decisions. Something like click-through rate doesn't really do a very good job of capturing um, you know, what these ugly underlines might do to Microsoft's brand in the long run, right? This feels sleek and modern, and, uh, and that's what the kind of the image that Microsoft wants to uh, project. Okay, so I'll end it off there, and then you can do some examples, and then uh, we'll come back and, and talk more.